Uh, the other thing I was now going to talk about is troponin testing, and particularly high, sensi oops, high sensitivity uh, troponin. So what sort of questions might we be thinking about when we go into this? So the question as usual is, what, what's the answer I'm trying to get by measuring a troponin? And it may be, uh, usually it relates to, is this person having a heart attack is the most common question, but uh, just make sure you know why you're doing it, and not just doing it because you think it's the thing to do. Uh, we talk about, we're talking about high sensitivity troponins, and I'll talk about, think about what does a sensitive test mean? And it can have two main sort of meanings uh, in terms of laboratory testing. It can be, have a clinical meaning and it can have a laboratory meaning. So what do we mean by high sensitivity troponin? Uh, what's not as high? What's, what's it mean? Uh, and then do I need to change my approach to troponin testing? And particularly I'm talking here about the uh, use in general practice in the community. So have a think about those things. So first we'll talk about what is cardiac troponin, because we talk about it in terms of, of uh, heart attack testing. This is a diagram, this is a zoom in very close of a, each of our muscles have these fibers or these uh, threads running through them that, call, that give you the contraction power of the muscle. So there's thousands and thousands of these running through each muscle. Uh, but you've got to work out how you're going to tell it to contract and how you can tell it to relax. And it turns out this, tr this little complex here that sits uh, on top of the uh, other proteins is what switches the contraction on or off. So as it turns out, cardiac troponin is involved in activating the contraction of muscles. That's sort of not necessarily that important when you're measuring troponin, but it does tell you why it's in muscle in particular. So diagrammatically, if this is a a heart fibre, I don't know if you've seen microhistology of muscle, but you see all these little bundles of stuff running through the muscles, uh, and these are myofibrils. So within these, there's many, many of those little strands inside another lot of strands, like a bit of like nested rope. Uh, and so the important thing to understand is that the troponin sits in basically two places in these muscle fibres. As you expect, a lot of the time it's actually attached to that contraction mechanism that we saw in the first diagram. But the cell has to make troponin before it can sort of use it. And so you get a proportion of, of troponin that's actually sitting in the periphery of the cell waiting to be used or in the process of being used. The importance of that is that this troponin is really stuck on hard and will only really come out when you get muscle necrosis. This troponin is sort of floating around in the soup, and so if the wall of the muscle fiber becomes leaky, it's potentially this can leak out without actually having muscle fiber necrosis. And this can explain sometimes why you might get transient low-level changes in troponin that aren't really in a sense a heart attack, but they're an insult to the heart, can release some troponin. So I don't know, yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Well, probably at least a bit more than a marathon, uh, usually. But yeah, marathons, uh, you'll see my list of things that raise troponin. Uh, marathons, the type of things that can also do that. Which is one of the reasons that it doesn't always show a heart attack. It just shows some insult. shows that something happened to the heart, basically. So I'll talk about troponin in the context of how we used to diagnose uh, heart attacks in the 80s and 70s. So you might remember CK or CKMB was the older analyte for looking at heart attacks. Uh, and this is the blood levels of troponin. I've mentioned troponin I here. There's two main types, or there's two types of troponin that are useful to us, troponin I and troponin T. Uh, and there's also a troponin C that's no use to us because it's the same in muscle in the heart and muscle in the skeletal system. <coughs> But troponin I and troponin T have specific versions for the heart and specific versions for the skeleton, skeletal muscle. So using troponin I or troponin T, you can tell that it's the heart that's releasing the troponin. Uh, 
certainly for the newer assays, you might f come across some articles from the 80s that weren't so clear cut. That was because the test was still being developed and there was some cross reactivity. But these days, troponin I and troponin T are specific for cardiac troponin only. So this is a graph of blood levels. Someone has a heart attack here, uh, and the red is the CK. You can see it went up and came down, peaked about one and a half to two days, then came down. This is the reference range. Came down back into the reference range after about three days. Sometimes we looked at lactate dehydrogenase, or LD. It came up more slowly, but lasted a bit longer. The advantage of that was if someone had a heart attack a few days ago, then we used to measure the LD to see whether that might have been a heart attack, even though the CK was back to normal. Why would you be interested in a heart attack a few days ago? Well, sometimes people, particularly diabetics, might not get the cardiac pain characteristic of a heart attack, but they may present a few days later with increasing congestive cardiac failure or something like that, and you suspect it might have been what's called a silent infarct that happened a few days ago. But all those days are behind us now because the, one of the advantages of troponin uh, is that it goes up. It goes up very high compared to where it starts, which makes it easy to measure in, in a sense, uh, and falls away much more slowly. So you can use it. This is 10 days out to 14 days. Probably you can still find positive troponins after a heart attack. And again, some people might not present. They might come into you your GP practice saying, oh, 10 days ago I had this really funny pain. What do you think it was, Doc? Or Merce? Uh, sometimes we still use a CKMB in the hospital setting. So in, cardi in coronary care units, you might have someone who's already had this troponin rise and they're not sure if they're having another infarct down here and so their CK will return to normal, but if it comes up again here, that's a sign of a secondary infarct. So occasionally you will see cardiac units measuring CKMB for that particular purpose. But it shouldn't really be used to investigate this early part of, of the heart attack. So what's the problem with that? Well, there's still a, so the oldest cardiac troponins, so the ones before high sensitivity, had the problem that there was still this gap of up to 12 hours before the troponin would become detectable with that old measurement system. And so you had to observe patients for 12 hours before you could work out whether they had a heart attack, definitely not, or definitely not had a heart attack. Uh, as you know, there's a premium on, on um, emergency beds, emergency department beds. So having people sitting around for 12 hours when you know whether they had a heart attack uh, one wasn't necessarily very good if they did have a heart attack, you could have been treating them hours ago, uh, and also clogged up emergency departments for all these well people sitting around waiting for their 12 hours to go past. In fact, about a quarter of people who come into hospital query heart attack already have positive values the minute they hit the hospital. That's possibly because they've either had some release before they got, well, it means they've had some release before they got to hospital. So you don't have to wait for every, always. Some people will have diagnostic troponins when you first see them. Uh, but to be sure it's negative, you used to have to wait these uh, up to 12 hours. So what we want is, if you like, we'll say, oh yes, we'll have a more sensitive assay and that will help, which it does. But there's the question of what sensitivity can mean in terms of testing, and there's two types of ways uh, to talk about sensitivity. One is what's called analytical sensitivity. So that's how well our test measures really low values. And in terms of how well it measures low values, we talk about accuracy and precision. So you want to have uh, an accurate result, which means you get the same result. Uh, you get a uh, result that reflects the true amount there. And you also want a precise result, which means if you keep measuring the same thing, if you keep measuring that blood sample, you'll keep getting the same result time after time. And there's uh, a trade-off between how low you can measure something and how precise you want to measure it. But this, they're sort of analytical questions. And really, high sensitivity troponin really refers to analytical sensitivity rather than clinical sensitivity. Clinical sensitivity is how well it protects it detects a particular disease. In some sense they're related, but it's not highly sensitive because it detects 
myocardial infarcts at a highly sensitive rate. It's highly sensitive because we can measure really low levels. That has implications for measuring heart attacks, but it also has its problems. So the high sensitivity refers to analytical sensitivity. So one person said about uh, troponin that it's organ specific, not disease specific. So troponin or cardiac troponin is very specific for heart muscle, uh, but it's not specific to a particular disease of the heart or particular situation. So this is just a few causes of release of troponin. Uh, there's a big long list I can refer you to. Uh, usually we're interested most in this area, the acute coronary syndrome. So that's just used to be called heart attacks, but because as we get more and more adept at picking up problems with the, uh, the heart, then we, there's a blurring between what used to be called unstable angina uh, and different types of uh, heart attack. So now they're all sort of lumped together as acute coronary syndromes. So you hear people talk about acute coronary syndromes, but it means basically heart attack, mild heart attack, almost a mild heart attack, so it's that sort of grey area. But apart from these, these are ones that are caused largely by ischemia. Uh, if someone's got a myocarditis, so these are typically the young guys you see that die unexpectedly, or young women die unexpectedly because they had a, a viral myocarditis uh, that they've uh, basically knocked their heart about severely, uh, or other types of myocarditis. That's inflammation of the heart muscle that's not due to uh, ischemic circulation problems can also raise uh, troponin. Pulmonary embolism, so this is a, a, a blood clot in the lung. You think, well, how does that affect the heart? What it means is that the blood clot gets pushed into the, the lung or into the vasculature of the lung, and so now the heart has more resistance to pump against, and so that extra strain on the heart of trying to deal with a blood clot in the lung can actually strain the heart enough to release some troponin. So in pulmonary embolism, you can have some troponin released. Uh, in sepsis, so this can be pretty well any type of severe sepsis when the body's really sick, if you want to look at it that way, um, it'll irritate the heart and you'll have some troponin released from the heart. And recently there was a case where someone who was clearly quite a severe pneumonia, someone decided to do a troponin on them, uh, found it was positive and actually went down the heart attack track rather than treating the pneumonia. So it's something that can distract and give you, in a sense, a sort of a false positive. It's a true positive troponin in that being really sick can release troponin from your heart, but it's not something that you need to treat separately from the actual treating the sepsis. Any type of heart failure can, can be a strain on the heart and so have a release of troponin. Some chemotherapies, not all, but some chemotherapies do knock the heart around a little bit and you can find some increased troponin after chemotherapy or shortly after chemotherapy. Uh, people with renal failure, there's possibly a few reasons why they, their heart's not doing so well, either accumulation of toxins or the hemodynamics of renal failure or dialysis. Uh, so at end-stage renal failure, you can have troponin levels. Uh, and I've called ultra-athletes there. I've called marathon, I'll call an ultra-athlete. But, you know, uh, more classically, the people that do the 100-kilometre runs or the, the really extreme sort of runs. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. Do you find with some of these though that you want to get a low level? Like, is there any correlation between how high, like? Or, or the uh, not necessarily. Uh, well, because how high is just how much damage the heart? How much supposed to tell you what's causing? Yeah, well, one of the problems with sort of measure, and there's been a whole lot of studies about how the amount of stuff you find in the blood relates to the amount of heart that's been damaged. Mm -hmm. One of the problems, if you cut off circulation from a part of the heart, not only does the blood not get in doesn't get out either. Mm -hmm. So you can actually have a large part of the, the heart dead, but because it's not getting any blood in, it's not releasing its troponin. Its troponin is not really getting out into the circulation. Uh, the other thing that complicates it now is if you're treating a heart attack, uh, you might have an area of the heart that's short of blood supply. They go in, do the stenting or give the, uh, the anticoagulation. That then opens up the blood supply to the heart area, which is good but it also flushes out all this troponin and, and CK. So you can get the people who get the highest 
uh, troponins in are almost the people who are doing best because they've had the best revascularization of their reperfusion type thing. Uh, in the old uh, in the so old days when they're measuring CK, there was a lot of work done in, in correlating it. But now that there's more aggressive treatment that has that reperfusion and, and that in the mix, uh, pretty much. Having said that, if I was having a troponin level, I'd rather have a little bit <laughs> than a lot. But it, but it's not something that you can really bank on. Yeah. When they spoke to someone else, yeah. they said it's fine. But would you expect if it was a cause like that, um, that you're not going to get, because it's, it's, you know, you would expect it's not going to get a huge... Yeah, well, there's a couple of aspects to it, and, and I'll come on to it a, a bit later, about how you use your opponent to actually work out whether it's a heart attack yeah. or not. With some of those ones, if it's not a heart attack, it'll be elevated, but it'll just sit at a single level. Whereas a lot of the diagnostic criteria for heart attack is actually troponin going up rather than just actually being there. Uh, so they usually do a three hour space of troponins uh, can be used to have a look at what's happening. But can I just ask a question? Oh, yeah. yeah. So about probably eight or nine years ago, there was some decent um, research done where they were using delta trots in alongside decent decision making tools and positioning the stop. And they found that that was quite a bit of a success with that. But Australia seems to have been quite slow to adapt to that given the price of the emergency there. Is that something that you see? You mean like the percentage change? No, no what I mean is that, so a delta troponin is one that you take up to three to four hours rather than six hours. And they found that there was no increased risk of mortality by using that. But we don't seem to have adopted that. Uh, well, I'll come back. The recommendations for a three-hour protocol these days. Okay. Yes, but so we're not doing that in our area. And that's something in primary practice you can't really um, often get the six-hour trot. And to be honest, I have a GP that uses, I work in aged care, uses a troponin as a one-off so that they can be able to say to the family, that, you know, the patient had a heart attack when it was most likely yeah. the CCF or the heart failure or the renal failure. Yeah. Well, I'll come to that in a moment and talk about those different aspects of it because there's a guidelines to do with it. Just to finish off uh, talking about troponin sensitivity itself. So the definition of high sensitivity troponin uh, is that, and this is technical definition, you forget it if you like, but if someone asks you what it means, this is what it means. Uh, it means that if you have your normal population here, uh, in the past we could only sort of measure down to here and then most of the population just was the result was less than something, and we couldn't measure down there at all. Uh, or, and also around this point, the measurements were pretty dodgy, so that was very variable. The assay was straining at that point, and you couldn't really get precise answers, so the, ver the answers would jump around quite a bit. The two points about a high sensitivity troponin is that this coefficient of variation, which is a measurement of the variability, uh, is 10% or less at the 99th centile, so you should be able to measure down pretty accurately down to 99% uh, of your population, so only 1%. So what you're saying is that the people that are going to shift up here, you can make sure you can measure all these people very accurately. But not only that, you're saying that you can probably measure at least half of the normal people's troponins in a reasonable way. It might not be as good as a 10% CV, but you can measure down into the normal range reasonably well. So, you, and that's trying to have a look at that gap between where people come in. Uh, in the past, you couldn't measure troponin. Now, even in normal people, you can measure, start measuring troponins when they walk in the door. And at least half your people, ideally at least 95% of your people, but the definition at least half your people. So this is a high sensitivity troponin timeline uh, to understand what's been happening. Uh, so about 2011-12, the testing sort of be started becoming available. So it's not a super new test, uh, but the application of it sort of matured over these last uh, five or six years, or six or seven years. Uh, 2013 to 2016 was really when people were developing guidelines of how you should use it in emergency departments, and that's one of the guidelines I'll mention in a moment. 2016, people are still wondering how it should be used in primary care. I've actually said still in 2018, people are wondering how it should be used in primary care. 
Uh, I'm putting it in 2017, the FDA started approving the high sensitivity troponins. Uh, the reason I put that in is it means it's talked about a lot more because it's happening in the States. So you'll see a lot more literature about it since 2017 because it's relevant to the United States and they publish a lot of the literature. Uh, and the other thing we're debating is in low risk groups uh, what the role of troponin should be, which is sort of overlaps with the primary care question. So this is an example of a guideline that came out in 2016. Uh, Louise Cullen is one of the ones from the Royal Brisbane Hospital, the others are from different Asian countries. Uh, and this was a consensus statement in 2016 about how to use uh, troponin assays with focusing on high sensitivity troponin. Uh, and basically this is where they're recommending using a delta change as part of the protocol. Uh, you don't need to go into it, basically you do one straight away. If it's really, really high, then that's bad go down here. Uh, <laughs> it was, so that's, they use 10 times the upper limit of normal as, as really bad for that case. Uh, otherwise you do serial ones and in particular uh, you do a retest in three hours, you have a look at the delta uh, and then you go down to these. So that's uh, probably what Queensland Health Emergency Departments use mm -hmm. uh, and so that was what a recommendation in 2016 was for that's in hospital sort of use. Doesn't necessarily address the uh, question in general practice. So this was another guideline that came out in 2016, also by Louise Cullen, but also with uh, uh, Connor Roney. And the question was, what is the appropriate way of using troponins in general practice? Uh, also, the a discussion at the same time was medical legal aspects of if you do decide to do troponin tests in general practice we'll come back to that in a minute. So having a look at these uh, <coughs> the recommendations and I'll highlight a couple of bits that's their recommendations in full but basically if you break it down uh, when don't you use troponin so you don't use it if someone has anything happening in the last 24 hours before they saw you <clears throat> if they've got something happening in the last 24 hours before they saw you, uh, or even if it seemed to be longer, they've got some significant problem. So it might have been two days ago, but their ACG is, real, is bad now, then they should go straight to a hospital emergency department by ambulance. Don't put them in their own car, uh, but by ambulance. <clears throat> So that's a recommendation from these guidelines about, or maybe guidelines a bit strong, but it's a recommendation. It's not being formally accepted by any particular group. So when is it okay to do troponins, high sensitivity troponins in general practice in these people's view? So if they've been symptom free for at least 24 hours uh, and the event was no longer than 14 days ago, so sometime between 24 hours and 14 days ago they had something happen that they're talking to you about, but they've been symptom free for the last 24 hours uh, and they don't have any high risk features. So what they talk about in terms of high risk features is they do have pain from time to time or they're feeling like they're going to faint or they've got evidence of heart failure or their ECG is abnormal. That put them into that don't use the troponin and put them in the ambulance emergency category. But if they don't have any of those then do a single troponin test but what they say is you should do it urgently because you're, once you decide to do a troponin test, you think, well, maybe something's happened. So it's an urgent answer you want back. Uh, but also you should be able to be contacted to get the result. So they're basically saying that it's no good saying at 4.30, I'm on an urgent troponin and then just disappearing. Uh, you have to have some process in place to actually be notified of the result. When I was working in Sydney for two years, one of my frequent jobs was to ring up troponin results to general practitioners. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't always as contactable as you might like, and sometimes you had to ring the patients and, and talk to them, which wasn't really my role, but it should be the role of the general practice, either whether it's the nurse practitioner or whether it's the uh, doctor involved to advise them uh, what action should they should take depending on either reassure them that troponin came back as normal or if it was abnormal 
uh, then I'd recommend getting an ambulance to them to take them to the hospital. Some patients, when you ring them, will want to go themselves. Oh, I don't really feel like an ambulance. <laughs> Particularly in Queensland, it's paid for these days, but in New South Wales, it was often a significant expense. I did have one patient where I rang because the doctor wasn't available. I uh, convinced them to take an ambulance, and I got a <coughs> excuse me, got a note from the wife saying that I actually collapsed in the ambulance. So <coughs> it was potentially, you know, would have been disastrous if she'd just been driving her husband to the hospital. The other thing I'm also a bit worried about is traditionally. Some people get angina just by exposure to cold air, so just the change of environment of going out into a cold environment may trigger an instability if they've got an unstable angina. So I think getting a nice ambulance trip uh, is certainly the best thing to do. So that's one view there, that the ways you can do it, and there's been GPs that have supported that approach. Uh, there was this other one, other commentary that came out of similar, that on this particular recommendation. And this was by the medical advisor from Avant, which is the medical legal insurer of a lot of uh, Australian doctors, and said there's still a couple of problems uh, potentially with this. Uh, firstly, you might end up, if you're going to order a troponin sometime, you might end up ordering when you really didn't need to order a troponin. If you thought more carefully, maybe there weren't really a, uh, as high a risk of cardiac problems as you thought, and you end up doing a troponin and uh, end up with the complications of, in terms of unnecessary hospitalizations and, and things like this. So if you're going to order troponins, you've got to also work out when not to order troponins uh, and when to order troponins. So you may end up ordering a troponin on a patient you should have just shipped out straight away to the uh, emergency is the temptation, I guess they're saying. Uh, and the other comment they had is that it does then put a from the medical legal risk point of view, you've got to realise that it is really a time critical test that you're doing. Uh, and so the GP practice must have a system in place to follow up the test in a timely fashion. So you have to be not only waiting for the laboratory to ring you, and they've left a the number, they're going to ring me. If you don't receive it in a certain time, then it's also a requirement of you to chase up the pathology laboratory. You might not think it's your job, but it is, as well as the pathology laboratory doing things in a timely fashion as well. Uh, and the other thing it, it mentions which I hadn't really thought of myself is you have to warn the patient about what the things, what's going to happen on the basis of the results. So if you say I'm going to do a troponin and you don't really explain to them all the implications of it and then at, at uh, 6.30 at night they have to suddenly go to the emergency department they might have thought well I would have rather, rather gone if you told me that was an option, or that was a likely out, possible outcome, I would have rather just gone straight to the emergency department at 3.30 in the afternoon. Uh, you know, what's that happening? Or if something uh, you know, bad does happen, because you're telling the patient, well, if I ring you up and you've got a hydroponic, you have to get an ambulance to the hospital, uh, they'll appreciate there might be something going on. Uh, and so you've advised them and you've given them the option, presumably, of going to straight away to emergency department as an option. So these are all sort of medical legal risks. Even if you're, you're doing the right thing by the recommendation, you've got to do the right thing properly and make sure it flows through uh, and you've got a system in place for all that. Yeah. yeah. Well, some guidelines, yeah, this guide doesn't actually, I don't think from memory, it, does, it doesn't say you have to have them on observation. There have been other guidelines yeah. that say if you order it, you should have them under observation yeah. with a resuscitation yeah. stuff available. I think the basis with this one, they tend to be guidelines where you're ordering a troponin and it's been less than 24 hours in some guidelines, so they're a bit more risky patient. I think the argument with this is because it's, it's been... low risk patient. Yeah. It's reasonable for them to... I mean, you wouldn't say go and play soccer this no, afternoon no. or no. call you off the... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just, just be in a safe environment waiting for notification or if, you've, if you're worried about it, we can put you in a side room here or if that's not suitable, then you do need to go to the hospital, mm -hmm. something like that. Are there any other questions about those sort of guidelines and protocols? I mean, it really depends on what your local practice is and how things work together. Uh, 
just as an example for result. Now, a bit wary of putting out results because our units are a bit different from yours. Uh, ideally, you should be reporting in nanograms per litre, and this should be 12, 14, and 40. But the reason our laboratory reports it this way is that some of the point of care instruments don't actually allow you to report anything other than in this format at the moment. So the consistency across our laboratory system, where we've got, got 270 point of care instruments as well as the laboratory, uh, we stick with units that are comparable between the point of care instruments and the uh, main laboratory. But if you look at these in your private practice or your general practice, I hope this will be 12 and 14. But basically, this is this example of uh, normal uh, troponin results. Uh, and we give a little blurb down the bottom about where, why we think that 99th centile, if you go back to the, that protocol, the 99th centile is sort of a cutoff point for action. And so this point 04, we spend quite a little bit of time validating in our own local population with our own local instruments that that was a valid 99%. Other laboratories will have different 99% depending on what particular assay they're using primarily. Uh, particularly with troponin eyes, that's produced, there's a whole lot of companies that produce troponin eyes and they don't all agree because it's an immunoassay and so it's hard to get and there's no special standard. Troponin eye occurs in lots of different fractions in the blood and so it's hard to measure. The other companies, there's one company that measures troponin T largely because it had a patent on troponin T measurement early on. Uh, and troponin T does have some advantages in that it's, it's much more comparable from one laboratory to another, uh, but laboratory just decided to troponin I, troponin T, and essentially as long as you understand what's being done, then they're uh, equivalent. Uh, so that's just zooming in on those, those results. So it's a bit of a sort of danger area as to whether what what lurks beneath the surface of the patient when you're doing a troponin. I think you need the new picture of the, um, the serpent that got cleaned up by the dolphin. <laughs> 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 well, you didn't that? see that coming. <laughs> well, actually, there's a second picture of this. That looks... But there's another picture taken shortly after where you can actually see that's a whale's tail. So this is actually a, oh. a, whale, sh a whale going through the surf, not a shark. So are there any questions? We've got a few minutes before four o'clock, if anyone has questions about anything, pathology in general, philosophy of reference ranges, which I <laughs> spoke about with one of the people. So one of the questions was, with the reference ranges, you know, why don't laboratories have the same reference ranges for, to make things more easily comparable? And I said this, Laboratories around Australia are trying to consolidate reference ranges on about 30 prime uh, analytes, so things like sodium, potassium, chloride. We're trying to all get together. And so across, the, across Australia, there'll be one reference range for, for as many analytes as possible. Some analytes, it does, the reference range does change according to how you measure them. So because particularly measuring an enzyme, exactly how you tweak that enzyme changes how fast it seems to work in the in your test system, so there's just some things that are hard to, to standardise. The next lot of things we'll try and standardise are probably some of the endocrine tests. Uh, the other thing I was saying is, because philosophy is also part of doing reference ranges, the question is, well, what's a normal range? And I can't use the example of glucose, which sort of relates back to the HbA1c. So what's a normal fasting glucose? And there's probably at least three answers to that. One approach is to say, well, take our reference population, wandering around the street, pull them off the street, do their fasting glucoses and you'll get this distribution, we'll take the central 95%. The problem with that is there's a lot of people who, for either being overweight or otherwise unhealthy, have unhealthily high glucoses, but they're considered sort of normal at this point in time. And so if you do a reference range that way, which a laboratory could, could do, uh, you'll have quite a high cutoff for a fasting glucose. Another approach is to say, well, the World Health Organization says that if you've got a glucose greater, fasting glucose greater than six, you've got impaired fasting glycemia, so therefore you're not normal, and we'll say normal glucose is up to six because you don't meet the WHO criteria for any diabetes-related value. Uh, but then you see, well, the Australian Diabetes Society recommends that if you've got a fasting glucose of greater than 5.5, you should be thinking about whether to do glucose tolerance testing, 
So we'll call up to 5.5 normal and above that abnormal because you have to think about what to do. So there's different philosophies will give you different reference ranges even for exactly the same analyte and exactly the same test. Well, if there's no other questions, then co you can come up and ask me things uh, for a little while afterwards if you like. But thank you very much uh, for coming along. Thank you.